Well, good morning and welcome. Wow, it's good to see everybody here today. Thank you so much for coming and joining us in worship. And to those who are joining us at home online, we are thrilled that you're a part of this worship service as well. And we are thinking of you and we're very mindful of you and aware that you are worshiping with us at this time. Here at the Edmund Church, we do love our children, and there's some children that are here in the auditorium, but there's also some children watching online at home. And so kids, gather around for a minute, because we're going to have a special time thinking about our children. First of all, I want to introduce you to one of our new babies. This is Hannah K. Reeder, and isn't she cute? Yes. Born on October 26, 7 pounds, 5 ounces, and Brayden and Julie are her parents, and she is a cutie and boys and girls we want you to be a great example for for hannah and help her to learn and grow and become like jesus and it, we like to think about how if we were to act like jesus wants us to act and then she would act like us she would be acting like jesus so let's be good examples for each other we're so excited and in, in, in thinking of her in fact we're going to pause right now and say a prayer for for her and her parents Dear God, we do thank you for every good and perfect gift that you bring us. And we really do believe that children are a gift from you. So we've been praying for Hannah, and now she's here, and we want to thank you for bringing her into this world safely and for her health. But more than that, we look forward to her future. God, would you help her to grow to become the person that you made her to be so that she could uh, do the things that you would have her to do? And be with Braden and Julie as they parent her and her wonderful family that she has that surrounds her aunts and uncles, her grandparents. But Father, help her to also be blessed by her church family. And may we surround her with love and be good examples to her. Thank you so much for this gift. You bring so much joy into our lives. Father, we pray for, for Hannah. It's in Jesus' name we pray as together we all say, Amen. Well, we're excited about Hannah, but we're also excited about our children who have been doing their memory work in Children's Bible Hour. And uh, these are the names of, of those who this month did their memory work and quoted the memory verse in Children's Bible Hour. So if you see them, you make sure that you uh, tell them how proud you are of them for taking God's Word and hiding it in their hearts through memorizing it. They were studying in Children's Bible Hour this month about People like Esther and Job and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and Daniel. And as they talked about their lives, they talked about all the difficulties and challenges and, and hard life circumstances that, that they had to face. And yet each of them faced those circumstances with, with faith and with hope. And they, they did what God would have them to do, even when other people talked bad about them or they were persecuted or made fun of. Even if they were sick, they would still go before the king and say what needed to be said. They were people that were people of faith and people of hope. And so here's the memory verse that they did. And it's in Joshua 1.9. And let's all read it out loud together. And kids, if you memorized it, no looking at the screen. You got this already. But for the rest of us, let's read together Joshua um, chapter 1 verse 9. Remember that I commanded you to be strong and brave. So don't be afraid. The Lord your God will be with you everywhere you go. Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. It was true for Esther. It was true for Daniel. It was true for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it's true for me and you as well. So let's be strong and courageous because we don't go anywhere alone. God's always with us. God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, He's so good to me. Well, we are a family. A church family and so wherever you are at this time we're part we're glad that you're part of this family and so welcome to this time of worship we're glad each of you are here in this auditorium and uh, we appreciate how you're very mindful of the situations we have so if if you need a mask uh, we have some gentlemen that are ready to bring you one or if you a communion packet for communion a little bit later if you forgot to pick one of those up just raise your hand there's gentlemen that are watching right now and they'll be happy to 
bring you one. But we're thrilled that you're here in this time and place to, to worship with each of us because we do serve a good God who is worthy of our praise and wor worthy of our worship. And so we come together in this time for getting uh, our placing the distractions of this world in the perspective of God's glory. And so we give him worship and we give him praise. And to help us do that, we have a very special verse selected. I forgot to tell you this. On the screen is the QR code to let us know that you're here. You know, it's hard to keep up with everyone in this time, and we're doing our best. So all you have to do is point your, your, uh, your smartphone at this um, on your camera, just Click what drops down there and let us know you're here. Or you can do it through the bulletin or online. We really would like to hear of your presence. And so if you have a chance as you leave the building or right now to point it at the screen, we would certainly appreciate it. Now back to focus on worship, though. And that is this God that we give all praise and glory. So if you would, stand with me. and We're going to read from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 together. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Come now, God, of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, all for
Thank you for this opportunity to worship together, both in person and online. God, I pray that the service will be pleasing to you. Father, I pray for the healthcare workers in this community and around the world. God, as they tend to the sick, thank you for their servant hearts and their dedication. Give them the strength to continue to bless others. Thank you for Kent and the ministry staff here at Edmond. God, I pray you will speak through Kent today. Help us to have an open heart to receive the message. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus. That's in his name that I pray. Amen. O oh Lord God of Israel, there's no God like you. Chapter 19, verses 26 through 27. 
says when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples he loved and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby he said to her woman here's your son and the disciple here is your mother from that time on this disciple took her into his home it may seem like uh, a very uh, insignificant comment that Jesus made on the cross. However, this is one of the seven comments that Jesus made while he was on the cross. And if you ever study that, you'll see that each one of these comments has something to do with our life. Well, this is relational. God has always sought for a relation with his people. In fact, he gave Jesus to seek for this relation. But Jesus knew even at the point of death, there is no way that we can survive without relationships. He says this and backs this up. He says in John 13, 35, everyone you'll know my disciple, your love one for another. Matthew 22, 36 through 39, this is when, when he was asked about what is the greatest commandment? It's to love the Lord thy God. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus went on the night before he was betrayed. The one thing he prayed for was unity, to have the same unity as he and his father has. It's a big deal. Relations are big. During this time, we struggle with our relationships. This pandemic has separated us in so many different ways. No longer do we seek to have relationships with strangers. We struggle with having relationships with our coworkers with our neighbors, those here that are, that are among us in the, in the body of Christ. We even struggle with that. We struggle with our family relationships. We can't survive without relationships. We need it. Jesus knew it. But at this time, this is a time that we commune all together, not just those that are in this building, but those that are watching, those that are in Brazil, those that are in Nicaragua or Haiti or Canada, or Germany, we're all about doing one thing together, and that is our relationship with God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for Jesus, and we know that he died so that we can have that relationship with you. Father, we pray that you'll be with us now as we look back and we remember Jesus and we remember the broken body that was for us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let us continue with the cup. Our dear Father, we again come to you thanking you for Jesus, thanking you for this sacrifice, knowing that it was the blood that was shed for us that covers our sins daily. Father, we know that there's no way we could ever stand before you without our sins being purified. Thank you so much for his death, but most of all, thank you for his resurrection that he overcame death. It's his name we pray. Amen.
This concludes our Lord's Supper. Um, you know, during this pandemic, we've also changed a lot of things. Uh, one is our giving. We no longer pass the plate around to give, but there is um, still the need for the church to continue its work. Uh, there is, as you see on the screen here, a couple different ways that you can give. And each one of these um, makes it most convenient for all of us to give. So let's pray for the let's pray for our gifts. Our Father in heaven, we've been so blessed. You've loved us so very much. You've taken care of us, and we're so thankful for that. Help us at this time to understand that we're giving back to you those things that you've given to us, knowing that it's yours and knowing that it's always belonged to you. Father, help us do this cheerfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Thou art worthy, great Jehovah. so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. At this time, we're going to dismiss our children ages three years old through the second grade uh, to Children's Bible Hour. You'll see the instructions on the screen. If those would like to participate, they can exit into the foyer area and they'll be taken to the Children's Bible Hour room. And don't forget to pick them up after it's all over. For the rest of us, let's stand as we sing this song before Ken's lesson this morning. And kept along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall build the glowing skies against the foe in mills below.
Not only have I enjoyed that introduction, although it does make me want to take a trip down the hall occasionally, I have loved this sermon series, this time that we've been stuck talking about hope. And today we talk about defiant hope from Romans chapter 4. So when you see the word defiant, do you think positive or negative? Because you can look at it both ways. Defying literally could be defined as to refuse boldly, to obey, or yield to. And so a lot of times when you use the word defiant, it's placed before the name of a child, a defiant child, a defiant student, a defiant employee or employer. And so it can be negative, but it can also be a positive. To be defiant, to boldly refuse to yield to the circumstances of this world. To have a defiant hope. One of the things I do as a minister of the gospel is I speak hope into situations. A lot of times it's a celebratory hope like we just did. Introducing that beautiful little baby girl. Or maybe it's hope spoken at a wedding when a couple is together and you speak hope into their future. But there also is a time of speaking hope and of an enduring hope into those times at the side of, an, a, of a sick bed or even beside a grave. We speak hope into happy times and also we are all as ministers of the gospel to speak hope into hard times. So this world it looks at defiant hope and maybe it looks at the negative or it defines hope in a way that isn't a biblical way. <laughs> as, as people in this world we commonly say things like, I hope so. I wish that could be that way. It'd be really nice if it was. So I, I hope so. I hope we get to go out to eat at lunch. I hope that I don't get sick. I hope that. And you know, that's, that's a hope so. And that's definitely something the world understands and likes to define. But the biblical hope is not a I hope so, it's a I know so. It's, it's standing in the midst of the circumstances of life and defying them and say, I know so based upon God. It is a defiant hope. It is a biblical hope which is a contrast to the everyday uncertain hope of this world. We face difficulties and challenges every day, every week, every year. And so it's not surprising that right now, and this year, we face these challenges and these dis difficulties. And in the past when you faced them, or even this year as you face those challenges, did you ever just want to give in or give up? Or maybe just get out, get out of town, get, get away. Instead, as Christians, when we face those same desires, we are called to have a defiant hope, to boldly refuse to yield to life's circumstances, to refuse to yield to this world and those those uh, concepts of giving in and giving up and getting out of town. We're to have this defiant hope. You ever heard the phrase death defying? <laughs> death defying act. Usually that kind of catches your attention because somebody has done something really unwise or I mean death defying, you know? They defied death in trying to do this. And it gets your attention, and you watch, and you pay attention. In this world, Christians are called to, to be, def, have defiant hope. Even when everybody else says you shouldn't have hope. And if we can walk into the world this way, it will be, they will give us our attention. They'll pay attention to how we live our lives, because in the midst of a hopeless situation, we had a defiant hope. Hope against hope. Hope against hopelessness. One of my first uh, roles in ministry here at the Edmund Church of Christ was in campus ministry. And I had a great time. In those early couple of years of ministry, uh, in, in 1989, a, a young man named Jake Preston came to, uh, to Oklahoma Christian and joined our campus ministry. And he was very active in Colorado. He liked to hike and to ski and hunt and fish. He was even a whitewater rafting guide up in Colorado. He played football. He was a competitive swimmer. And here he shows up in our campus ministry. Immediately, he became very, very active. The picture on your left there is uh, 
Jake in Children's Bible Hour doing puppets in the back. That was the puppet stage in rooms five and six in our old building. And he with a bunch of some other college guys were back there doing puppets. He also, because of that adventurous spirit, was a part of our first mission trip to Mexico. And there's a picture of him with our group there in Mexico. One of the things that we, uh, stories we told about Jake in Mexico, well, when we went for our first trip, they didn't have an outhouse. It was very challenging the first few days. So immediately we went to work building an outhouse. Very important to us from Oklahoma. And so we, we dug the hole. Here's a picture of Antonio, the son of Jose, who was preaching there at the time, helping us build this outhouse from wood that they'd harvest right there in Aquilas. And the joke was, you know, Jake was not a little guy. He was a big guy. And so when it came time to cut the hole in the outhouse, Antonio took a tape measure and walked over to Jake and measured his backside. And we laughed and teased Jake about that always. It was one of the fun stories of that first trip. Jake was such a, a vibrant young man and so much a part of our, our ministry. Well, that summer, Jake went to work at the Edmund Aquatic Center, right, right just by our building. It's called Pelican Bay now. It was the one before they built Pelican Bay. And he managed that. Jake was a great swimmer. He was on the swim team. And during the 4th of July holiday, he did something he had done hundreds of times before in that pool and other pools. He dove in. Only that day, that evening, he dove in with a little bit too much inertia behind it. And he dove into the pool, a strong, vibrant, healthy young man. And he came to the top of the water with a broken neck and a quadriplegic. I'll never forget getting called that day. I could tell you right where I was in the backyard holding my infant daughter who had just been born and got the call to go to the hospital. And I rushed up to be with Jake. Jake was in the hospital here till August of, of that year. Then they took him up to a specialty hospital in Colorado. This is a picture of Lisa Graw that day as we all, the college campus ministry, gathered around him to send him back, send him off to Colorado for the hospital. That, that next school year, on fall break, we used to go do Kids for Christ Youth Rallies. And we went up to Littleton, Colorado and did a Kids for Christ Youth Rally there. And here's a picture of me. I want to point out that is me with him, in case you can't recognize the guy in the picture. Jake loved children. And, and we were all surrounded him, and we were, we were very excited. A year after his accident, Jake came back to Oklahoma Christian, where he finished his degree and became a part of our campus ministry and met a young lady named Stephanie Bolton. Stephanie was a sweetheart of a girl, and they fell in love. Jake always said that Stephanie looked past the wheels and saw the man. And so on August 14, 1993, in our church building down on 9th Street, Jake and Stephanie were married. I got to do the wedding ceremony. Now, he's a quadriplegic, and if you remember the old building, some of you still do, we had to build a ramp to get him up on the building. And that ramp had to come back about <laughs> halfway to that auditorium so he could ride that ramp up on the stage. And it was a traditional wedding of the, that day and age. His, his parents and her parents came down and lit a candle. And then they took the two candles and they united them together into one flame, the unity candle. And Jake was determined to do this. And so that he worked very hard and they, they worked it out. He got wax all over his hands. That's okay. He couldn't feel it. But he, he got it there. They got the candle lit. I was so proud. I'm up there. You can only imagine doing the service, nervous and wanting to help. They get the candle lit, and then, of course, you blow out the family candle to represent the unity of the two candles. He blew out both candles when he blew it out. He got it out, but he blew out the unity candle as well. But it was going to take more than accidentally blowing out a unity candle to split these two people apart. Because Stephanie fell in love with a man that, not, that was not uh, able to do everything everyone else was. She fell in love with him that man. And with his bride by his side, he came, he was able to do so much. 
Their love began on August 14, 1993, and they recently celebrated their 27th wedding anniversary. And with his bride by his side, he continued. He went on and uh, earned his master's degree, then on to, to do his doctoral coursework in higher education and administration. You can go into that next picture. And he also came back and worked at Oklahoma Christian University. He worked at Oklahoma State University, the University of Wisconsin, and also the University of Kansas. He lived a full life and found ways to continue to hunt and do the things that he loved. Jake was determined. I can remember many times Jake saying, I can see myself walking again. I believe something can change. And he had this hope. Jake peacefully entered into his heavenly rest on August 29th of this year with Stephanie right by his side. You see, when life's circumstances indicated otherwise, Jake and Stephanie chose to hope against hope, to place their hope in the promises of God. And I'm here to say today that we are called as Christians to have the same kind of defiant hope. A hope against hope, like Paul said. Romans 4.18 In hope he believed against hope. And I'm here to tell you, you don't come by this naturally. You're not just born and automatically know how to do this. Like you watch other people and you learn how to talk or you watch other people and you learn how to walk. You don't watch other people and just learn this hope because you don't see it everywhere. It's not how most people talk and it's not how most people walk. But as Christians, we're called to live this in the world. And we do have examples to follow. In a sense, maybe Jake. But the Bible is filled with people who showed us this walk. Have you ever heard the phrase hope against hope? This is where it began. In fact, this is where the phrase come from, comes from. When people say hope against hope now, they mean just to cling to a mere possibility of something. But that's not where it started here in this passage with Paul. It is hope even if you have little reason for it. You can't justify the hope. Hope against hope. So how do you have this kind of defiant hope? This hope against hope. I think there's several things we can find in Romans 4 that point to it. And the first is if you want to have this kind of defiant hope, you have to face the facts. You do have to face the facts. It's not saying I'm going to deny reality. Look at verse 19. Without weakening, weakening in his faith, he faced the facts. That his body was about as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Abraham is, is who we're talking about here. And this hope against hope was the fact that he was going to have children. That this nation, as numerous as the sands on the seashore, would, would come from him. And here he is, old. And, and Sarah's old. And how in the world can he reason this out and how he can be a father. But he, this hope against hope was not him defying reality. He looked and he faced the facts. He saw the condition of his body and his age and, and of Sarah's. He didn't deny it. He didn't reject it. He didn't deny reality. He saw the facts. If I were to say, dum da dum dum if you're under 50, you think of a commercial just now, right? But those of us who are older... Anybody tell me who that reminds you of? Wow. Dragnet? Please. Am I the only person? Back in the 50s? And, uh, and when I, you think of, of, of Dragnet, do you remember Sergeant Joe Friday? Mr. No Nonsense. He is often quoted as saying, just the facts, ma'am. In, in reality, if you watch the shows, what he, he was really saying is, all we want are the facts, ma'am. Or all we know are the facts, ma'am. In other words, in the midst of all the hysteria and all the speculation and all the worry, just the facts, ma'am. That dragnet back in the 50s used to start with a very ho-hum uh, voiceover uh, saying, The story you're about to hear is true. 
The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You know, just the facts. As Abraham had to face challenging times, as Esther, Job, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, as they face those difficult times, so do we. And we should not ignore the facts around us or let the emotions of this world distract us from what is truth. Abraham acknowledged the facts, and he did so without weakening his faith. Without weakening his, in his faith, he faced the facts, the fact that his body was as good as dead. He believed in God's ability to fulfill his promises, and that belief outweighed the circumstances in which he found himself. And that faith was not some leap into the dark or some irrational decision. It was a deliberate choice to place his faith, his hope, in the promises of God. It was his decision to connect faith with the facts that were in front of him. There is a significant, significant connection for Christians between strong faith and a stable, defiant hope. And he faced the facts, and he did so without weakening his promises. How do you have a defiant hope? If you face the facts, you also have to face God's promises. Verse 20, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. When he faced the facts, he let the light of God's promises shine onto those facts, and that's how he faced them. We need to face the facts as we face the problems and turn our face towards truth. And the promise of God. As the song says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look, look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. He remembered the promises of God. And so in these moments when you want to give in and give up and get out, remember the promises of God and let them shine into those situations. I'd be very curious to hear, when I talk about the promises of God that help you through the dark times, when you need to have this defiant hope and let the promise of God shine into it, what do you think of? What verse comes to your mind? So I asked myself the question, since I couldn't figure out a way for you to respond, and the first one I thought of was Hebrews 13, verse 6. Oh, wait, so let's, let me start with Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. It wasn't the first one I thought of, it was the third one, but I decided to start with this one because it was Old Testament. Excuse me. But some of you thought of this. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. He shines His light into the circumstances and now you see the direction to go and you can walk this path. The first one I thought of was Hebrews 13. I like verses 5 and 6, but let's just look at verse 6. So we say with confidence in the midst of all these circumstances... The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man, what can this world, what can mere mortals do to me? And of course, if you know me very well, you know I probably thought of 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. I'd love for you to text or email or send me your promises. So that they can be a blessing in my life. And I can know this is what that person thinks of. And I want to use that same kind of hope that they're able to find in this passage in my challenging times. How do you have defiant hope? You face God's promises. And when you let that promise shine into that circumstance that gives you this faith and this defiant hope. And so we face God's promises without a wavering unbelief. He did not waver through unbelief. He was able to take God at his word and do what God called him to do. And it gave him strength and it helped him to walk on. He didn't waver or sink or become overwhelmed and drown in the circumstances of the moment. James would say in James 1 verses 6 through 8, But when you ask, you must believe 
and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Such a person is a double-minded and, and unstable in all they do. Because of Abraham's strong faith, he was able to have a stable hope. Because he believed in the promises of God. So what brings stability into the midst of the storms of circumstances in life? That stability is found in this kind of defiant hope. No one's defying that the storm is blowing. Face the facts. But what brings stability is this defiant hope that Abraham had and that I can have as well. You've probably heard this quote by Lisa Copen, who's the author of several books who, and a, a ministry that talks about chronic illness and pain. She's quoted as saying, have defiant hope because reasonable hope isn't really hope. And she said it in a very good way, what I'm trying to say as well. You can have a reasonable hope, which is what the world tries to say, or you can have a real hope like Abraham. And that's a hope with an attitude. A defiant hope changes us. Paul talks about this in, in Romans 4. A defiant hope leads to a stronger faith. See it there in verse 20? But was strengthened in his faith. Because he, he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promises of God, he was strengthened in his faith. Stra faith gets stronger when it's exercised. And that means that we have to learn how to be persistent, to have this defiant faith in the midst of challenging times. Abraham went through many obstacles in life. And his faith saw him through them, and his confidence in God grew because of it. He faced the facts that could have led him to doubt. And I'm not saying he was perfect, because he did doubt it. But overall, he maintained his trust. He may have hesitated or questioned his own ability. And when he did, that caused some problems. But he maintained his trust in God. Defiant hope leads us into a stronger faith. And that stronger faith is that blessing that shows us we can do this. And a defiant hope also leads to giving glory to God. You see it there in verse 20? He gave glory to God. Abraham's life points to God. It pointed to, to God, and it's like Paul is using it here, for those Jews to say, remember Abraham and what he went through in this promise and how he stayed faithful and had this defiant hope? Let that bless you now. But it also does that for us. And may our defiant hope point to God. May it bring him glory. And may it bless those around us and in this world and those who follow behind us. A defiant hope means giving glory to God. In Jake and Stephanie's wedding, they had me read a, their favorite verse. Here it is. It's Romans 15, verses 5 through 6. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was true for that young couple, and it's true for any couple on their wedding day. But it's also true for the church. The world's going to focus on what they see that limits us. But with hope against hope, we can live in a way that gives glory to God. That brings hope into hopelessness. A defiant hope. Jake and Stephanie were a beautiful example in my life. But the Bible is also filled with wonderful examples. This last month, we taught our children, among those, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You can see this, the story in Daniel. We're going to pick it up in Daniel chapter 3. While the king had, had, had liked them and, and believed in them in ways, he continued to push, and finally he's going to lose his, lose his uh, he's going to become very angry with them. We pick up the story in Daniel 3, verses 16 through 18, and see this defiant hope. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we not, do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. We're not going to bow down. If, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, 
The God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. That is defiant hope. It's not a reasonable hope, like I hope, I hope he'll save us. It's a biblical hope that says, I know so. And that strong hope, that defiant hope, leads to giving glory to God. It's that hope with an attitude. It wasn't just a hope that we can escape. It was a hope that endures. It wasn't just a reasonable hope. It was real hope. And the key to living today and tomorrow with this kind of defiant hope is to be fully persuaded that God can do what he says he will do. Verse 21. Being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. That's how Abraham felt. He had a defiant hope. He dared to hope. He was fully persuaded, fully convinced that God is able to do what he has promised. He looked to God and he obeyed God and waited for God to keep his word. It was true for him and it can be true for us. Just a few verses later in verse 25. Talks about how he was delivered over to death, speaking of Jesus, for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. We have this kind of defiant hope because of what Jesus has done in our lives. And friend, if, if you're listening, if you're here today, and you've never given your life to Christ, I hope you'll consider it. Because on that cross, he delivered us from our sins. And he was raised to life from that grave for our justification. You've probably heard, of, heard it like, uh, talked about with this great exchange maybe. This concept of when we put Christ on in baptism, an exchange kind of took place. We gave Christ our sins, and he gave us his righteousness. He gave us forgiveness of those sins. They were remitted. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We didn't earn this. We, Jesus did this for us. What an incredible bargain. What a wonderful exchange. And yet, why do you hesitate? Why do you choose to pass up this gift of grace to continue living with worldly hope? I hope today you'll consider giving your life to Christ in baptism. And have those sins washed away. And to walk that new life. In this world, it's not perfect. This isn't a perfect world. In shock of all shocks, I'm not a perfect person. But in this world, we can live a persuaded life. We can believe that God is able. This world is not fair. And in the midst of the unfairness of this world, we need to have a defiant hope. So on that night in July, when I was with Jake in the hospital in ER, another young man, almost his exact same age as Jake, came into the hospital. He had been at the lake, partying, skiing. And when they were loading the boat, he decided to dive off the boat into the water. And yet he was so uh, drunk at the time, he forgot that he was on the boat ramp. And so he dove headfirst into the boat ramp. And he broke his neck, the exact same vertebrae as Jake. And within hours, they arrived at Presbyterian Hospital. And their rooms in ICU were right next to each other. And in Jake's IC room, there was a constant flow of, of people from church, and his parents came down from Colorado. Every day we were there with him. And in the other young man's room, 
There was a constant flow of family. I watched his mother put pinups that I wouldn't want my child to see above his bed so he could lay in bed since he couldn't move and watch them. And so as the doctors treated Jake and this other young man, we had hope for Jake to get better. We even prayed for the young man next door who eventually walked out of the hospital. About the day we put Jake in an ambulance to go up to Colorado for rehab. Doesn't seem fair, does it? It was a little bit hard to, to see and to, to watch. You know, the only person I didn't notice it bother was Jake. <laughs> he was happy that our prayers for the other young man were answered. But I'm here to tell you that our prayers for Jake were answered as well. When Jake passed away earlier this year, his family were, were, wrote these words of tribute to him. Although Jake's life was filled with constant physical struggles and setbacks, he lived life to the fullest with the support of his precious wife, Stephanie, who never left his side, and his family and dear friends. Jake loved Jesus with his whole heart. He lovingly served in his home church. And today we can say that Jake lived with defiant hope. And what he could see when I couldn't see it of a person walking again, he now is in the bosom of Jesus, whole again. And so when life throws unfairness at you, and you find yourself overwhelmed and about to drown, don't give up. Don't give in. Don't just try and get away. Jeremiah, in the book of Lamentations in the Old Testament, must have had all of those feelings. As he witnessed the fall of Jerusalem, the temple of God being destroyed, his people's killed and carried off into captivity. What a mess. And in the midst of that mess of the world at his time, he made one of the greatest statements of faith and hope. Lamentation chapter 3, beginning in verse 19. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I remember them well. And my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion and I will wait on him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. Dare to hope. Have you lost hope in God? May you be reminded today that he is a sovereign God. He is working even if you don't believe it or even if you don't see it. And I'd call you to dare to hope. To have that defiant hope. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I know it's tough at times. Dare to hope. Because God blesses those whose hope is in Him. And so walk into this week, into this world, with a defiant hope that people can't help but notice. And we're here to help you as well. Let us pray for you. You can go to our website and there is a, a click there. Pray. Go to the website. Be praying for others and let them know. You can just click on an icon. We can also pray for you right now. Reach out to us.
If you're at home, reach out to us. Send us an, an email, any way that you can. Go to the website. If you're here today, we'd love to pray with you. And friend, if you've never put on Christ, why not now? Why not have that kind of hope? If you need to respond, why don't you do so as we stand together and sing. Just as I am with God, we just uh, ask you to bless us this week, help us to go out and be a blessing to others. Help us to have uh, a defiant hope. I hope against hope that the virus can be mitigated effectively. Each and every one of us knows even within the church family, with Rich Waltz or friends like Jay Jones, co former co-workers like Lise Finley who have died, their families are still going through the grieving process and it starts to make us question and wonder. But help us to have uh, hope against hope that there, there can be a vaccine that's effective, that this, this virus can be mitigated, that it can be turned back. But help us also to have the perspective and understanding that there will be other sicknesses and illnesses that, that affect us and that cause us to, to feel pain and anguish and just Help us to have that defiant hope so that people ask us, why, why do you have that hope that through all this, that somehow we can be a light to the world, that we can have an opportunity to, to be Jesus to them. Just help us to go out this week and, and be Jesus to somebody. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Good morning. We're so glad that you're with us both at home and here in person. And we'd love to have you check in. And you can do that by using the QR code that is on your screen and using your phone. If you're here in person, you can go out and meet Kevin Rayner. He'll be at the Welcome Center. And if you're our first time guest, he has a special gift for you. We're very happy to tell you that last week, Rex Hibden was baptized. We welcome Rex to the church family here, and if you'd like to drop him a note and send him something and let him know that you've been thinking about him and praying for his new walk, you can call the church office or email them, and they will give you his address. We do want to share our sympathies and condolences with Valerie Gleghorn and Melanie Hollingsworth in the death of their grandfather, Charles Kelsey, who is also the uncle of Joe Kelsey, so being praying for them and their families. 
do have several things that are coming up we want to highlight and mention. First of all, it's Christmas Wish. If you are a part of that program and you have some gifts to drop off, those are due by Wednesday, December 9th. And the distribution will be on Saturday, December 12th. Be praying for those who are part of that distribution and the blessing and impact that they'll have on those families and the children for Jesus. Also next Saturday is our annual breakfast with Santa, and that's for families with children up through the fifth grade. And you can register online for that through today. That will close at the end of today. Also coming up is Financial Peace University from Dave Ramsey, and that will be a nine-week course that begins on January 11th. There are more details in the bulletin, and you can register online. Many of us in the congregation have gone through that program, sometimes more than once. And if that's the case, maybe you know somebody that that would be a good thing for them to go through, and that's a, a great gift to give to a couple or an individual, and that's $95 either for a couple or an individual. Finally, our fall speaker series continues. We have a new course that's going to be taught by Phil Klutz that will begin this Wednesday, December 9th, and it's entitled Discover the Heart of Mentorship. Phil is leading the mentor ministry uh, here and would love to study that and, and share with you what that's all about. That will begin Wednesday, December 9th. Again, thank you for being here, both with us in person and at home. We're blessed to be together. We have a, a, I hope that you have a blessed week, and now we are dismissed.